chapter 9. And uh, our theme for this month, we're looking at missions and talking about uh, our missions as a church and talking about missions from the Word of God and praying that the Lord would use this month to lay on our hearts and to greater our, our burden for the lost. And uh, we're going to be looking at a passage this evening here in Matthew chapter number 9 that speaks about that and that speaks to uh, the harvest. And uh, whenever I think about the harvest, I think about, uh, think about growing up and think about working uh, at my grandparents and, and think about the garden and all that they had and various different things um, there that they had uh, that we used to pick and go out and do and think about getting out in the garden and picking things and whenever you think about a harvest that's just what tends to come to mind and I can't help but to think about uh, sometimes the the tree that uh, uh, many of you will remember uh, brother Edward Chancy uh, that was a member of this church for many years and uh, at his house and on his land down there uh, he had a tangerine tree he had a couple of trees there that when they blossomed and that they bloomed at time of harvest, when it was time to harvest those things, you could pick and pick and pick and pick tangerines off. As a matter of fact, one of the first years that we were here, we went down and uh, we picked uh, five-gallon buckets um, of tangerines and gave them to all of the different fire stations around here. And uh, we brought them and, and they just... You would look at that tree and you would see all of the fruit on it and you could pick and pick and pick and it still just looked like the thing was completely full of tangerines. And they were some of the best tangerines you have ever had in your life. I mean, you could spend forever out there just picking and eating those things. They were so good. But when I think of a harvest, I think of things uh, like that. And I think about this passage, that, that image comes to mind and I'll, we'll see a little bit more here as we read this passage this evening why that image comes to my mind of a tree that's just full of blooms. And although you pick and pick and pick, there's still plenty to be had and still plenty there. And uh, we see that here in our passage this evening. Matthew chapter number 9, we're going to begin reading. I just want to read a few verses beginning in verse 35 and to the end of the passage. The Bible says that Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in this passage this evening. Father, I pray that you would help us as we look into your word tonight. I pray that you would use this time together, Lord. I pray that you would help us to have a great burden for the harvest. Lord, I pray that we would follow some of the guidelines that you set forth for us here, and, and as you talked about the harvest, and as you had compassion on people, I pray that we would do the same, and I pray that we'd see your example and see your heart for people. Lord, I pray that you would give us a burden here at Coastal Baptist Church. I pray that these people that are here tonight, I thank you for them coming out in the midst of a storm, Father. And I just pray that you would help them this evening and help us this evening to have a greater burden for the lost and to have a greater burden to pray for the laborers that would go forth into the field of harvest. Lord, we thank you so much for all you have done and all that you are going to continue to do in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Uh, notice with me here uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see his example in this passage. If you were to jump back to the beginning of the chapter and you were to go and you were to read through, you would notice some things about the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in verse number 35 that he went about all the cities and villages. I don't know if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, but if you are, I'd encourage you to mark, uh, to mark or to underline that little phrase there, that he went about all. And you might circle the word all there. It says he went about all the cities and the villages. We are told a very limited number of things that the Lord did while he was on this earth. If you take together all of the culmination of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and look at the Gospels and look at all that they write about, 
you really have just a small little piece of the Lord's earthly ministry of that three and a half years. John actually writes about that and he talks about that. He says, he talks about all that the Lord did and then he, and I'm paraphrasing here, but what he says is, I guess if I were to tell you everything that Christ did, that it would fill all the books that are in all the world. I mean, we couldn't possibly go through and tell every little thing that Jesus did in the three and a half years while he was here. But the Bible tells us that the same thing that we see in the passage before is the same thing that Jesus did to all of these villages, all of the villages and all of the different cities. And I, I took note and I just wrote this down here. There's no one that he wouldn't go to. There's no one that Jesus wouldn't go to. Uh, he went to all of these villages. He went to all of these places and he encountered all kinds of people, didn't he? If you just begin to think about the people that Jesus came into contact with, remember there were times where the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, the uppity crowd of the day, the religious people, how they, he eats with sinners. He, he, he must not know what kind of a girl she is because if he knew, if he were a prophet, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. And yet the Bible goes through and the Bible talks about all these number of people that Jesus came into contact with. And the wonderful truth is there is no one that Jesus would not go to. There's no one that he would not talk with. There is no one that he would not try and get them to come to an understanding of who he was and the gift that he offered of himself. And so I mark that and take note that, that he went about to all. As a matter of fact, if we look back earlier in the passage, uh, he is going through, and the Bible says in verse number 18 that while he is speaking and while he's talking and doing some of his teaching, that there came a ruler who came and, and, and came and said to him, My daughter is dead. And Jesus, he gets up and he goes with him. While he's going with this ruler, there's a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and she came and she just touched the hem of his garment and she said if I can but touch his garment I can be made whole so here's this whole group here's this whole congregation of people that are thronging around Jesus as he's going to follow this ruler to go to his home and, and this woman just grabs the hem of his garment and he says to her daughter thy faith hath made thee whole and he says and as you go on there you keep going down the Bible says that he gets to this house and there are people that are there and, they're, and they are making noise, the Bible says, and that he says to them, he basically says to them, watch out, uh, the maid's not dead, she's just sleeping. And the Bible says that the people laughed in the scorn. But he goes in, he raises this girl from the dead. Then as he goes out and about and leaves, the Bible says that his fame is going out and when he departs, from there, and he's going, there's two blind men that meet him, by the way, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And after he heals them, the Bible says he asked them, he says, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes are open, and they're healed. And then as he's going, the Bible says that they brought to him a dumb man that was possessed with a devil, so he can't speak. And, and, and here he is, and the Bible says the devil was cast out. And then the man that was dumb and couldn't speak, now he spake, and the multitudes, they marveled at. Here in just a short period of time, you have Jesus going through and healing the woman with the issue of blood, raising someone from the dead, healing two men that were blinded, and now casting out devils and demons. And all of this is taking place, and the Bible says he went to all of the cities and all of the villages going and doing these things. There's no one that Jesus wouldn't go to. What a wonderful example that Jesus is to us. How often do we look at times in life and we are a respecter of persons for a better way, for not a better way to say it than that. We're a respecter of persons. We look and we think, well, I'd, I'll talk to them about the Lord, but I'm not sure I'm going to go over there and talk to people about the Lord. I'm not sure I'd talk to that group, or I'm not sure I'd talk to those people, or I'm not sure about going here. We become a respecter of persons. But Christ went everywhere. Notice what he did as he went. The Bible uses three words. In verse number 35, it says that he was teaching in their synagogues, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and he was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. That's what he went about doing, teaching and preaching and healing. We could say this today, I know that you and I, we don't have the power to go out and to heal people, right? We understand that. But we do have the power to go out and to help people. 
And we do have the ability to go out and to teach the Word of God and to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We still have that same ability to go forth and to do that today. That's the example that Christ set forth. Let me ask you, as we go out and about our, our way and as we live our lives, do we do the same type of ministry as what Christ did? Do we teach and preach and help others along the way? That's what he was doing. And because he was willing to help at many times physically, he also helped and did spiritual things as well. Now, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that every single person that he healed physically was made whole spiritually. It doesn't mean that every person that you help physically is going to come to Christ spiritually. But the goal and our heart's goal ought to always to be to teach them the Word of God, to preach the gospel to people, and to help them along the way. It's what Christ did. And then notice that the Bible says in verse number 36 that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. That word is an interesting word there. William Barclay, a, a biblical historian, he writes and he says, the word which is used for moved with compassion is the strongest word for pity in the Greek language. It describes the compassion which moves a man to the deepest depths of his being. Charles Spurgeon said of this word, he said, the original word's a very remarkable one. He said, it's not found in classic Greek. It's not found in the Septuagint. He said, the fact is, it was a word coined by the evangelists themselves. They did not find one in the whole Greek language that suited their purpose, and therefore they had to make one. This word that speaks of compassion and, and how the Lord was moved with this compassion within himself, it's a word that, that has the idea of not just to feel sorry for, not just to have pity upon, but to have enough to be moved enough to do something about it. It's the same word that would be used in Scripture later on to speak about the Good Samaritan and how when he saw the man that was lying by the road who had been left naked and, and left half dead, that he saw him, and the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And he was moved with compassion enough to do something about it. Remember the other people that walked by? There was a priest that walked by, and the Bible says he looks on him, and he passes by, and he keeps on going his way. There's a Levite that went by, and the Levite even actually goes over and, goes, uh, and looks at him and probably was moved with some compassion or, or moved with some pity anyway and looked at him and was kind of, oh, man, that poor guy. But he didn't have time to stop. He kept going, the Bible says. But then the Samaritan comes along, and he looks, and he sees he picks him up, he puts him on his own beast, he wraps his wounds and tries to help give him medicine and all to heal, takes him to the inn, pays his bill, says, listen, if you need any more, let me know next time around, I'll take care of it. He was moved with compassion. It's the same word that's used of the prodigal son's father when the Bible says that he looked and saw him afar off. You remember the, the account of the prodigal son? He goes away, takes his father's inheritance, that he would have gotten when his father died. He takes that inheritance, he goes, he leaves, he squanders it on selfish living. He goes and wastes it all, the Bible says, with riotous living. Then a famine comes to a land and, and, and everybody's without money. He spent all of his money, he doesn't have anything. Now he's in the pig pen, feeding the pigs. And the Bible says he, he, he fain would have filled his husk, uh, or <laughs> would have filled his husk, would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave to him. Finally, he came to himself. The Bible says he said, he says, my father has more than enough. The, the servants of my father's house, are, are, they have plenty and are taken care of. I'll go home. I'll tell dad I've sinned. I'll tell him I've done wrong against him and against God. And I'll, I'll beg for forgiveness. And I'll tell him I don't want to be, I don't need to be your son anymore. Just make me like one of your hired servants. And I will live for you there if you'll just feed me and give me a place to live. The Bible says his dad sees him coming from a long way off. And he says that he had compassion on him and so he sat on the front porch and tapped his foot and waited until he could say what have you been up to no that's not what it says it says he had compassion on him and he ran to him and he met him and he and he threw his arms around him and he and he kissed him again and again and again is the picture that the bible gives why because he had compassion and it moved him to do something 
this word that speaks of Christ, it speaks of Him being moved with compassion. Moved enough that when He saw the crowds, when He saw the people, that He was moved to go and to do something about it. I was driving the other day. Um, it's been hot this week. Hot. Even for South Georgia, it's been hot. I, I looked on my phone and it was 90 some degrees just a couple days ago. It was 90 some with a feels like temperature of 113 here it said. For those of you who are watching via video, if you live up north, praise God for that right now at this time of the year. But 113, I was driving along and I saw somebody on the side of the road and he was out there and he was having to change his tire. I had pity on him but I didn't have compassion, I'm sorry to say. I didn't pull over and stop and ask him if he needed help. Don't be judgmental. You didn't either, okay? All right, so I, I didn't pull over. I didn't have enough compassion. I wasn't so moved. He looked like he was doing all right, okay? So I convinced myself he was fine. He looked like he was doing okay, and he was getting that tire change on there and was getting back. I was moved with pity on him. I meant, man, it's hot out there, and I wouldn't want to be that guy right now. Have you ever done that with somebody in, your, in that situation before? Boy, I'm glad I'm not that fella. Boy, I'm glad I'm not that person. And you have pity on him, and you see him, and you're like, oh, man. But did you have compassion? See, compassion is what takes us from the place of going, oh, wow, man, that stinks for you, to pulling over and stopping and saying, hey, how can I give you a hand? What can I do to be a help to you? Compassion is what moves us to action. When the Lord looked on the crowds and when He looked on the multitudes, the Bible says that He was moved with compassion. He was moved to do something about it. Why was He moved with compassion? The Bible says because He looked on the crowds and He said because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Here is the picture of the multitudes of the day. And it's the same picture of people who do not have the Lord today. The Lord looked on those crowds and He looked on those multitudes and He saw them as sheep that had no shepherd. They had no one to lead them. They had no one to guide them. And, and there was no one that was helping them. And they were scattered abroad because of that. They were fainting and falling by the wayside because they had no shepherd. They had no Savior. And that's the same thing that is true today. People without the Lord Jesus Christ, they will faint and fall by the wayside. They will be scattered abroad. They will go to their own means to try and, and fend for themselves. But there is no guidance. There is no overseer. And there is no helper. And the Lord saw that in His day. And He was moved with compassion. Moved enough to go about to heal and help them, to teach and to preach the gospel and the good news. But here's what came from seeing them. And this is what I want you to grasp a hold to and what we're going to focus the rest of our time on here for just a few minutes tonight is that what we're going to look at is the harvest that the Lord talks about. See, He went about and He set an example of what we ought to do and what we ought to be to those around us and what we ought to be to the lost and how we ought to look on the lost world and we ought to see them as sheep having no shepherd. We ought to see them as someone who needs the Lord. We ought to see them as someone who is lost and dying and who needs to hear the gospel of the good news. When the Lord looked out, He saw that. And these are the words that He says to His disciples. Hone in on me with verse number 37 and 38 for just a couple moments. Then said to His disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. Notice this. There is plenty of fruit. When it comes to the harvest and when it comes to those multitudes, Jesus saw and He noted this. There is plenty of fruit. There were two salesmen, two shoe salesmen. One was sent over to Africa, and he made it over to Africa, and he got off the plane, and as he went about and started looking, he telephoned back and he said, nobody wears shoes here. The, the market is, there's no market over here whatsoever. Send me back home. The second salesman got there the next day. He got off the plane and he sent back and he said, Nobody wears shoes here. The market's going to explode. Send me everything you've got. 
The difference is in their viewpoint. The difference was the way that they looked at it. See, sometimes we have a tendency to look at the world and we look at it and we go, this world is rotten and no good and, and wicked and, and, man, it'll take a miracle for them to be saved. Listen to me. I completely understand that we live in a world that is ugly, that is dark, that, as was mentioned a while ago, is turned upside down. People have rejected the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are continuing to reject that truth. And the Bible says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But can I tell you, it's always been that way. It's always been that way that, that we live in a dark world and that the world and that Satan does everything he can to blind the eyes of those that are lost, to continue to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But can I tell you that the same thing is true today that was in Jesus' day, and that's this, the harvest is truly plenteous. The harvest is truly plenteous. There is a lot of fruit out there to be picked. There's plenty of fruit out there that's available to be uh, one for the Lord Jesus Christ. What's our perception? Do we look at the world and do we say it's hopeless, they're lost and there's no hope for them? Or do we look at the world and do we see fruit that might abound? Do we look and do we see fruit that says, you know what, I know that that person is lost, I know that they've rejected Christ, but I also know that God is able to save even to the uttermost. Do we look and do we say, you know what, if I will preach and teach the gospel, if I'll be faithful to teach and preach the word of God, lives can be changed. If I'll be faithful to go and reach the lost with the word of God, I can, I can mark it down that God has said that as we preach and teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be those who come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that everywhere you go that people are just automatically going to get saved just one after another and one after another. It might take a long time. It might take years. I think about missionaries like Adoniram Judson who went to Burma and he was there for seven years before he saw his first convert. But now there are thousands and thousands and thousands that have come to a saving knowledge because of the teaching and the preaching and those who have continued on in the Lord. I think of William Carey and others who went and it was years before they saw a convert. But the truth of God's word hasn't changed. When Jesus looked out on the harvest, when he looked out at the people, he said the harvest truly is plenteous. There's a lot of fruit out there to be had. D.L. Moody tells a story about a young preacher who asked and who wondered how was it that so many people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through D.L. Moody's ministry. And D.L. Moody, Moody took him over to the window and, and pointed out to him and said, what do you see as you look out this window? And he started to point out the, the dry goods store and he pointed out this building over here and he pointed out all these things. And D.L. Moody said, that's the difference. He says, as I look out that window, I see souls and I see people who are lost and dying and on their way to hell, people who need the Lord and who can trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior if they come to know him. Oh, could I encourage you and, and, and plead with you this evening to look at the harvest and know that it is truly plenteous? Sometimes we, we, I know that we live in difficult times, and I know that we live in uh, a time where it seems like more and more people are rejecting the truth of the gospel and rejecting God's word. But can I tell you that there is fruit out there to be picked? Can I tell you that I thank God for the souls that came to the Lord Jesus Christ this week during our vacation Bible school. I thank God for the souls that will come to the Lord Jesus Christ as we continue to give the gospel. And, you, and, and it may take time and it may take hard work and it may take a little bit of watering and a little bit of planting along the way. But what did God say? What did Paul write to the church at Corinth? He said, he says, I've planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. Can I encourage you that, the, that that truth is still true today? As we plant the seeds of the gospel in the lives of people and somebody else comes along and they water that seed and they give it, God will give the increase. God will be the one to save, but he has told us that the harvest is plenteous. Don't forget wherever you go, there is fruit to be picked. Wherever you go, there is fruit that is just waiting for us to reach up and to pull it off of the tree and to say, here is fruit for the Lord, if we would give the gospel. But notice this, 
Another truth about the harvest. Christ said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but, but the laborers are few. The harvest, the fruit, it's plentiful. But those who are going forth into the harvest to pick the harvest, they're few. Christ said there's not, there's not many going out and picking that fruit. That's the sad truth about the harvest. The difficult truth is that there's a lot of harvest to be done, but there's not a lot of people going out into the harvest. The laborers are few. We talked about this morning some of the numbers of people that are going out uh, around the world, and sadly enough, there, there's, there's not enough there's not enough going out. There's not enough believers. Statistically speaking, the average, I'm going to put, I'm going to put that in quotation marks, but the average Christian does not carry and give the gospel in the way that we've been commanded to in the Word of God. The average Christian does not go forth and share their beliefs with those around them. Unfortunately so. And at times, if we're honest, we're all guilty of having not shared the gospel as we ought to. We're all guilty of not speaking to someone about the greatest need that they have. And that's the need of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But Christ, as He points out to His disciples, as He looks on this multitude and as He's moved with compassion and as He's talking to them, He says, listen, that there's, a, there's a harvest out there that, that is plentiful. There's plenty of people out there who can be saved. There's plenty of people out there who need to be saved. There's plenty of people out there. There's plenty of fruit to be had. But the laborers are few. People aren't going. They're not giving and working as they ought to. So what's the remedy? What's the remedy? Obviously, we've been told to go. and We've been told to do that. But I want you to see what the Lord says in verse number 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. See, one of the things that is the remedy is that we're to be praying for laborers. We're to be praying that people would go. We're to be praying that someone would take and go and go and give their lives to go into the harvest. We are to be praying that someone would go and take the gospel to those who need it the most. We are to be praying for these countries that as we have flags around the wall and around our sanctuary tonight and as you see flags of different countries and as you see flags of, that represent different people groups all around the world, we're to be praying that God would take someone to that country. We're to be praying that God would take someone. Maybe there's an individual in your life that you're praying for. You'll be praying that God would send someone along their way, that they would run into someone that would give them the gospel. Maybe it would be a co-worker. Maybe it would be a, somebody from a church that would just bump into them at the grocery store. Maybe it would be somebody that would see them out and about and, and would tell them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe it would be a church from their area that would go and knock on their door and give them a gospel tract and say, this is what the Bible says concerning salvation. We'd like to tell you more about the Lord. We ought to be praying that the Lord would send forth laborers into His harvest. Let me ask you, when's the last time that you prayed that God would send someone to a lost loved one? When's the last time that you prayed that God would send someone to a certain country or a certain people group within a country? When's the last time that you prayed and said, Lord, send someone out of our church to go and to be a missionary? When's the last time you prayed and said, Lord, send someone out of our family if it would be your will? To go See, this is the problem when we start praying. We've got to be open to what the Lord wants to do. When we begin to pray, we have to ask the question first, Lord, would you send someone? And then we have to be willing for that to be me. We have to be willing for that to be my child. We have to be willing for that to be my closest friend. We have to be willing for that to be a Paul or Barnabas that's within the church. We have to be willing for that to be whoever it is that the Lord desires to take and to send and to do. Sometimes we get comfortable with where we are. And sometimes what we really need to be doing is praying that God would get us uncomfortable and send some people out to go into the harvest. Prayer is foundational when it comes to the harvest. The Lord says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
We say, well, what can I do about it? Well, I mean, you could go. God may be calling you, and you could go. But I can tell you what every single person is called to do, and that's pray. Pray that God would send forth laborers into, and notice these last two words, His harvest. His harvest. We have to remember that this is not my harvest. This isn't Coastal Baptist Church's harvest. It's His harvest. What are we doing for His harvest? What are you doing for His harvest? Are you praying for it? Are you going and telling and following the example that the Lord Jesus Christ gave? Are you living your life in such a way that you can look in Scripture and say, I'm doing everything that I can possibly do for my Lord's harvest? Because He's the Lord of the harvest, and He says it's His harvest. Pray that laborers would go forth and bring forth fruit. That's the whole point of going to the harvest is to bring forth fruit. That's what our heart's desire and our soul's desire should be, is to see more fruit come from the harvest, to see more people be saved, to see more people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because as we talked about this morning, there are literally billions and billions of people in this world that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can either look at it and we can say, wow, that is a, a wicked, horrible world. Or we can look at it and we can say, wow, what a fruitful harvest is waiting if we would go and if we would pray that the Lord would send more people. I hope that your heart's desire tonight would be to see more people go. And I pray that you would even pray and ask the Lord if that would be you. It might be a young person here tonight that God's working on your heart. It might be a married couple that God's working on your heart. There might be an individual God's working on your heart and talking to you about going full-time into the harvest. We've all been called to go. We've been called as a church. We've been called as individuals to take the gospel to the world. But there are some that God calls full-time to go and to be ministers of the gospel and to go and to serve the Lord full-time. Maybe the Lord speaks to your heart about that, and maybe it's something that He wants you to do. Be willing and ready to go, but, but be willing to pray and let others go also, no matter who they may be, no matter how close they may be to you, no matter if it's your child or grandchild or whatever it may be. Pray that God would send forth laborers into His harvest. Father, thank You for the time together in Your Word this evening. Lord, I pray that we would see this world as a harvest field.